worked really hard and they took their responsibility very seriously. So thank you so much. Then you go to 
through this whole process where they, you not only have to fill hundreds of forms and pay fees, but also you go and you talk to a, a embassy, no, to a, an official of the Homeland Security, and he asks you lots and lots and lots of questions. Some of them very hard, like about, does your husband have any scars? And so, like you really need to know them. What was their, uh, when do they first start at school? Or what's their favorite class? No, they don't ask you that. But they do ask you a lot of questions, just to make sure that you are really married to this person and that you deserve to live in the United States. So what's next for me? Next year. I'm gonna become a United States citizen, so I'm gonna be, I'm not gonna be a foreigner anymore. I'm gonna be, you can call me later on the American, but you can just call me Mrs. Dietrich too. But I'm gonna be a US citizen. And to become a US citizen, you have to fill in more forms, you have to pay more fees, and then, you have to answer the United States citizenship test. So I've been preparing and studying and reading some books and asking questions to Mr. Schaefer, and I've learned a lot. So what I thought would be really fun is to see if you guys could pay the pass that test. So, our volunteers, please.
so hurry up, let's be quiet and get through. Name one thing that borders Mexico.
When I last checked, she published eight stories in the last 48 hours. Uh, so it's been a fun time for her reporting here in Colorado. We met a long time ago doing theater uh, as a couple of severely extroverted 18-year-olds, like a couple of you, at Hillsdale College. And the one thing that awed me about her right away was her confidence in her calling to be a writer. She'd known that she wanted to be a writer since she was 10 years old, growing up in Cheyenne, Wyoming, just down the road. She decided that she wanted to be a journalist and to live in New York City, and so she did just that. So when I look up and I see her face as a guest expert from National Review on the news, or I see her articles in print, I'm not at all surprised. She is a tenacious and ambitious journalist, just as she always wanted to be, yet she has done it without sacrificing her principles. Jillian is an unmitigated idealist, which is like people who work and attend this charter school, and she is driven in pursuit by, uh, by her ideals. She is successful, but not at the expense of her inquisitive mind, her broad-minded conversation, and her loyal friendships. I am perpetually surprised by her strong but humane words, and I am always glad to hear a familiar voice in the media, especially when I am suffering through a 5K on a treadmill. Jillian recently returned from reporting in Iraq, and I know many people breathed a collective sigh of relief when she returned to her home in New York. She writes for National Review as a Thomas L. Rhodes Fellow for the Franklin Center of Government and Public Integrity. She is a member of the Independent Women's Forum, great name, where she writes on energy and environmental issues. She was a 2011 Robert Novak Fellow for the Phillips Foundation, reporting on Christianity in China, traveling extensively and writing for the Wall Street Journal, the Weekly Standard, Newsweek Japan, Double Think, and The Daily. She has previously worked as an opinion writer and a history page editor at The Daily, an assistant online editor at Commentary, and a Bartley Fellow on the opinion page of the Wall Street Journal Asia. Please join me in welcoming my dear friend, Jillian Melcher. Animals, not because he loved animals, 
but because it was a status symbol to take these animals, butcher them, and serve them to his guests for dinner. I mean, that's, that's how bad this guy was. Um, so last spring, or last winter, I think Ukrainians were really fed up with the corruption of this political system. And they saw that the way to get out of it would be to become more Western, to become more European. And they, they wanted to do that through economics. And so there was a trade deal that was going to be signed, but Viktor Yanukovych, the president, knew that signing this trade deal would bring them closer to Europe, and so he vetoed it. And so shortly before I went out there, a bunch of high school students, kids your age, decided that they weren't satisfied with it. They didn't like what was happening to their country. So they went to the city square, this place called Maidan, and they were protesting. Now, they brought a couple supplies, they brought blankets, they had these big signs, and it was actually pretty fun for the first few nights. I mean, they're sitting out there hanging out, playing pop music, kind of listening to things that they like. And then, things took a turn for the worse. Viktor Yanukovych sent out his riot police, the Berkut, and they started just beating these students. And I mean, these are people your age. They're sitting there out there in principles, and there are four or five policemen surrounding them. They've got huge sticks, they're just kidding me. And one of the guys I interviewed recalls kind of standing there and trying to put his body around this young girl. And even him standing there trying to protect her wasn't enough to stop the police from beating them. Well, down the road from my lawn, you've got Independence Square right here. And down the road, you've got this church. And this priest kind of hears what's going on, hears about the attack. It's very late at night. And he climbs up to the top of the tower. And there's a church bell. So in Ukraine, in the olden days, when that church bell rang at an unexpected time, they knew that the city was under attack. So this priest goes up to the top, and he starts ringing the bell, ringing it and ringing it and ringing it. And it goes on for about an hour or two hours. And slowly across Kiev, all the Ukrainians start waking up, and they realize that their city is under attack, and that it's under attack from their own president. So at that point, things really changed. I mean, this had been a protest about a trade deal started by students your age who wanted a better future for themselves. And at that point, they realized, rightly so, that this was existential for Ukraine, that this was about the future of their country, whether they were going to live in a free place that respected their rights, or whether they were going to live in a corrupt place where students like you could be beaten. And so from that point on, really on the students' momentum, they went out to the street, and this protest just grew. I mean, it was huge. And everybody was volunteering, taking stuff out. Now, this was super dangerous to do, because Yanukovych also understood that this was an existential threat. And so you've got Ukrainians coming bring tires to burn to build these barricades. They're bringing food, they're bringing medical supplies. And then on the flip side, you've got the riot police. And they're out there roughing up protesters. And then you've also got these roving bands of thugs that are around, beating up people. And a lot of Ukrainians think that Yanukovych actually released violent criminals from the prison and said, we'll let you go if you go beat up the Maidaners. But you know what? These people decided they were going to stay even though it was dangerous. And they really, they stuck with it. I mean, they're taking a huge risk. And I want to remind you, I mean, these are kids your age. They're as young as you are. So what happened is, this went on from November until February. And I want you to understand, kind of to get a sense of the tragedy that happened and also the victory of it. Maidan is in this sort of city center. And around it, you've got these steep hills. You've got um, this bridge. And then you've got these really tall buildings around. And so Yanukovych's riot police get to the top, and they start throwing down tear gas on people, and they start throwing grenades, and then they pull out these huge guns, and they start to shoot into the crowd. Now, the young men who were there on the front line who were getting shot at, they're really young. I mean, I think the youngest one who died there was 19 years old. Just a ton of people. So within a, a period of about three days, I think it was 100 Ukrainians died, most of them very young. So, um... At this point, Sophia comes in with her Molotov cocktails. And she, you know, she, they wanted to have a peaceful protest. But at this point, they understood that they needed to either stay there and defend themselves, or they could give up on the fate of their country. And so she's off in this corner, making these cocktails. She's got these bottles that they managed to collect. And then she's got petrol, which is like gasoline. And she's got stones, and she's got red pepper, and she's packing them into these bottles. And you can hear bullets whizzing by. And one of the fellow protesters says, you know what? Don't worry, Sophia. They usually ricochet. Pretty often they ricochet. And she's going, I'm not comforted by this at all. And it's a freezing night outside. And she won't go near the fires because she can smell petrol in her hair. She can smell it on her clothes. 
But you know what? As young as she was, she just barely graduated high school, she decided she was going to stick it out, that she was going to stay there. And she's not the only one. Another young girl I interviewed named Galena, she was talking with me about how um, there were hospitals there. But when someone got injured at Maidana, they couldn't go out and go to the hospital because the riot police would take them. And <clears throat> the riot police would maybe kidnap them, maybe take them to prison, and some of them just disappeared altogether. And so young people decided that they were going to build these hospitals to take care of the protesters that had gotten hurt. And I think the really remarkable thing about this is Ukraine had a medical system that wasn't very good. But because people were taking the initiative on themselves, they were raising money, they were doing it. Excuse me. My allergies in Colorado are terrible. <laughs> so they were um, arranging these secret hospitals. And within a couple days, they managed to pull together hospitals that were more sophisticated than the official ones that existed in Ukraine. So the dark days happen. 100 my daughters get killed. And in the end of it, Yanukovych left. He gave up. He ran away to Russia. And Ukrainians are going, this is great. This is our best chance for democracy in 100 years. Well, Putin decides that he's going to go down and take Crimea, which is in southern Ukraine, and that he's going to invade the east. But as I was talking to Ukrainians, I mean, I'm there when this is happening. And as I'm talking to them, they're saying, we're not that concerned. I mean, we're concerned for our country, for sure. We're concerned about what's happening. But through this protest experience, through volunteering, through going out and doing these things, we've learned that we're stronger than we thought we are. We've learned that we, as young people, are more powerful than we thought we are. And so, you know, I think Galena said it best, and I want to read the quote to you that she gave me. Um, it was really interesting. She said that what she learned is that things that the government couldn't do in years, you did in weeks. And that just shows that if you want to do something, you can do it. So I have a lot of confidence that Ukrainians are going to get the democracy that they want. And that's because, not that they have a really great country or a really great government, because they don't. It's really corrupt. But the young people there have done this. They've gone out and volunteered. They've served their country. And through that, I think they've learned to self-govern. So that's a really hopeful story. I want to talk about the other place that I visited this year, as soon as I grab a glass of water. So the other place I went to this year was Iraq, and that's a totally different story. It's not hopeful. Um, unlike Ukraine, where you have the patriotism of sort of hope and wanting a better future for the country, in Iraq, you think, I think you have the patriotism of necessity. I mean, it's a bad country. But um, what you see is people also kind of rising to the occasion. And I think that really struck me. I went out to uh, interview this girl named Hanji. 18 years old, she's a high school senior. She really wants to be a math teacher when she grows up. And she had a best friend, her cousin. And what happened was, I mean, you guys know about what's happening there. The Islamic State controls huge parts of the country. It's really barbarous. Um, I think Americans got a sense of that when the journalists, uh, James Foley and Stephen Sotloff, got beheaded there. So, but Iraqi teenagers know this violence firsthand. And I think Hanji in particular does. So she's this 18-year-old girl. And to visit her, we have to drive through northern Iraq. And we're about 45 kilometers away from where the Islamic State is camped out, like right here. We can kind of, I mean, we can't see them, but we can see mountains that they're hidden behind. And it looks a ton like the Front Range. Like, if you're driving up to Wyoming, that's exactly what it looks like. So we drive up to meet her, and I'm a little freaked out because, you know, they're that close. And we get there, and she's freaked out. But she's freaked out because she's seen them. I mean, she's 18 years old, and the Islamic State came to her village. Um, and just started kidnapping girls, killing men. And she and her family ran away and fled. And they just barely got away with their lives. I mean, they're running and they can see people getting shot behind them. And so Hanji's got a mom who's disabled. She's got a sister with a really serious heart condition. She's got a father who's blind and who's broken his leg. And then she's got nine younger siblings. And she's picking them up and carrying them with her, running away. And so her cousin, Salma, the other 18-year-old, gets kidnapped by the Islamic State. And Hanji knows a little bit about what's happened to this girl because one of her other cousins managed to escape the Islamic State. Calls her and says, what they're doing to us is terrible. It's so bad that we hope we die. So Hanji's there. She's in La Lush, which is the religious capital. And she's 18 years old. I mean, she's lost everything. Her home, um, her best friend. 
and she's got this huge family, and she's taken it upon herself to provide for them. And I mean, I think if you asked her whether she wanted to leave Iraq, she'd say yes in a heartbeat. But at the same time, she's doing the best she can. She's got this huge family, and she's providing for them. She's taking care of them. Now, you see that through a lot of Iraq. I mean, one of the other places that I went was this church in Ankawa, which is kind of outside of Erbil. And there's this priest there named uh, Father Douglas Bazzi. And Douglas Bazzi is telling me, I tell my congregation, get out of Iraq if you can. But at the same time, they can't. And this priest was a tough guy. I mean, he lived in Baghdad. He'd been shot. He'd been kidnapped at one point. His church had been bombed three times. So this is a guy who's no stranger to hardship. And he's sitting there and he's telling me, I don't know if I believe in my country. I don't even know if I believe in my faith. I don't know if, if I believe that God's in control anymore. But what I believe is I have an obligation to these people. And that it's my job to make sure that 30 years from now when they look back on this time, they see that good happened of it too. That if we believe that all things work together for the good of those who love God, my job is to take care of these refugees, to make sure that they have opportunities, that they have education, that they have something here and now. So, where does this take us back to patriotism? I think what these four stories have in common between Sophia the Molotov cocktail girl, Galena the medical volunteer, Hanji who was taking care of her family, and Douglas Bazi the priest, is that these people all served their community in a time of crisis. And I think, you know, what else can we learn from this is that we are really lucky. I mean, as Americans, we live in a country where we're probably never going to experience that kind of hardship. I mean, we have it really, really good. And I think that's an obvious point, but one I want you to get. So, when we're understanding patriotism, our privilege and our, our, I guess, our blessing of living in this country makes it a lot harder. I mean, we don't have to go out and do something crazy for our country or for our family. Because we are really privileged, but we can take that for granted. Just like we can take for granted religious freedom, or equality, or women's rights, or any of those other things. So, what does patriotism mean for us? I think for this, I want to borrow a quote from the Castro and the Rye, and that is that the mark of an immature man is that he wants to die nobly for a cause, while the mark of a mature man is that he wants to live humbly for one. So what does it mean to have a mature patriotism in the United States? Well, first of all, I think a mature patriotism means that we understand how blessed we are, and we can do that in a couple different ways. I think you guys are doing it right now. I mean, having a good education and understanding why a country is good, what makes it better than others, is critical. On top of that, reading is really important. Understanding what's going on in the world. And I'd encourage you guys, too, I mean, go travel. Um, you're young, and it's not beyond your means. I mean, you can save up for it, you can do it. And go see Europe, do that. But I'd also really say, go somewhere crazy. Um, go to a country that's chaotic, go to a place that's falling apart. And I mean, when you do it, do your research, be really careful. Your parents are going to kill me if they hear that I'm saying go somewhere crazy. So look into it and do your research. But um, when you do that, I think you'll gain an appreciation for your country that you wouldn't get in other ways. And then I think once you do that, the other thing that we're talking about with patriotism is service. And I think that's why those four stories meant so much to me of my travels in Ukraine and in Iraq. And that's because these people um, understand, I think, that the family and the community is the basis of a country. And they've all done things that aren't, in, in some ways, huge. I mean, you've got Molotov cocktail girl on one side, you've got a who's taking care of her family on the other side. And both of those things are things that build a community, that make it stronger. And so, you know, as you're going about your life, you're going you're gonna to experience hardship for sure. And it's probably not going to be hardship on the level of, like, Ukraine or Iraq. But that's also kind of like saying, um, eat your Brussels sprouts because someone's starving in Africa. <laughs> like, it doesn't really diminish your suffering. So when you come to those points in your life, I think you need to make the conscious choice to do the right thing. Make the choice to be a good sibling or a good child or a good spouse someday or a good parent. And think about ways that you can engage in your community. Um, ways that you as citizens can make your community stronger, make your family stronger, and uh, through those things, through those simple sort of acts of service, you're going to make your country a greater place. And I think that's the mark of a mature patriot. So I hope you do it. Thanks.
and it's actually, it was really crazy when I was there. Um, you could go past. So when I was there, the protests had just ended, but the people who had camped out there were still there. And so you could go around and look, and some of them had collected bullets that had been shot at in the crowd, and you could pick them up and hold them. So I saw that they were real. Yeah. Um, I'm working on it. Uh, I speak a little bit of Spanish, uh, so I'm working on Chinese. Times yet, um, but I've written for Wall Street Journal, which is a little bit more conservative. Yeah. In China, um, I was a foreign correspondent, so I had this fellowship for a year to write on Christianity in China. And in China, um, there's not religious freedom like there is in the United States. They've got um, so during the Cultural Revolution, they tried to get rid of Christianity altogether. They wanted to knock it out. But it didn't really work because people's belief is always deeper in God than it is in political systems. And so they had to stop trying to kind of knock it out, but they control it really carefully. And people aren't always comfortable with that level of control. So you've also got underground churches or secret churches that meet outside of government authorities. And that's what I focused on. I went to a bunch of different churches <coughs> all over China, um, meeting with them and trying to figure out why they believe in religious liberty, um, how they feel of it their liberty relates to politics and what being a Christian means for them in a place where they don't have religious freedom. Yep? When you say riot police, do they like um, use protective shields against the Yeah, and I'll actually tell you a really great story about this. So one of the people I interviewed in Ukraine was this artist. And uh, he remembers going up against the riot police. And the riot police are standing there and they've all got the same vests on. They've got the same sort of face masks on. They've got the same guns. They've got the same shields. And they're standing there against the protesters. And one of the really cool things I think about Maidan is that people thought not only as a political revolution, they understood that the things that they get their ideas about freedom come not only from thinking about politics, but from art and from culture. That all those things are reflections of the good and that freedom is a reflection of the good. And so one of the things that the protesters have done is they have these helmets that they've gotten through volunteers, and volunteers have painted pictures on them. So like this guy I talked to, he had a, he showed me his coat, it had a bullet hole through it from when they were shooting down. And he showed me his helmet, and it had this really intricate painting of a horse on it. And he said the thing that just blew his mind was, on one hand you've got all these riot police that are uniform, they're the same, they're part of a bad system. And they're faced off against all these protesters that have an idea about what freedom is, but they're so individualistic, and you can see that even on what they wore. Over here. Yeah? Are there so just in the... They didn't have guns, so one of the... I told you about the Molotov cocktails. They'd get those and throw it out. And I want to make a point about this. They tried really hard to be peaceful protesters at first. I think they saw that as the right thing to do. But much like in the U.S., when deadly force was used against them, um, revolution, I, I definitely don't want to be saying that like to protest government, you should be out there lobbing Molotov cocktails and stones and stuff. But they were really restrained, and they used it in a way that I thought was appropriate when the government started killing its own people. But yeah, they had Molotov cocktails. The other thing they did is it's kind of a cobblestone street, and they were chipping away at the stones and throwing it off self-defensively, too. One more question. I should take somebody in the back. I've been first two rows. Who's back there? All right, I'll take you. Oh. Oh. <laughs> With, when I was doing interviews? Um, that's kind of an interesting question. So in a lot of places, and I think it's great that you guys are getting Latin and Spanish and French because that's going to give you a great basis to learn languages for, at some point. Um, other countries do that really well. So a lot of the people, especially when I'm interviewing young people, um, they speak really good English. On top of that, I worked through a translator, which is also kind of nice because you have the chance to ask a question, and then they can give a response. And as it's being translated, you can write it down really fast, which is so helpful.
Um, we have chair stacking. Uh, we need orders of McNulty, Cycle, Og, and Scarlet to 